Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Maria Lasqui. I'm from Carve Communication. And today I have the pleasure of sitting down with one of my favorite clients, Nishant Patel. He is the co-founder and CTO of Content Stack. And we're talking composable architecture, essentially what it is, kind of demystifying it a bit, and why is it essential for enterprises today? So hi, Nishant. How are you? Hey, Mariana. Nice to be here. Yes, this is this is fun. This is not something I thought I'd be talking about, but here here we are. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, Content Stack? Sure. Uh, my name is Nishant Patel. I'm a CTO at Content Stack, and Content Stack is a content management and content delivery uh, software platform that uh, brands around the world uh, use to you know uh, create their you know experiences um, online. So. Yeah, glad to be here. Awesome. So I've been I've been fortunate. I've been schooled a bit about on composable architecture in the last couple of years when I've been working <laughs> with Content Stack. I'm far from an expert, but I I know enough to you know to get in trouble. Um, but this conversation I'm approaching squarely from the point of view of a non technologist. This is not my expertise, so you know I'm bringing the non technologist side of it. Um, and one thing I've noticed is that there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace and it's especially around the terminology. There's, <laughs> there's mock, there is composable, there is headless, there's API. I mean, I could go on and on. We could probably have a slide that has 60 words on there and make it all <laughs> the more confusing. So I'm personally excited to get some clarity today. So why don't we go to the, to the next slide and let's go ahead and start with mock. To me, that's a top gun term. But uh, tell me, what is mock technology? Can you break yeah, that down? Yeah, I think, um, sure. And, you know, mock uh, came out from a few vendors. You know, they put the mock alliance together and Content Tech was one of them. It's more just kind of giving our customers a way of evaluating technology. So it's, it's a set of like guidelines of principle, if you will, right? Like if you're going and purchasing a new technology, uh, is it mock enabled or does it adhere to mock principles? Um, so that was our way of just saying, hey, you know, there's tons of legacy stuff out there that just change your marketing and just say, hey, we're the latest and the greatest. This is like a quick way of you, you know, evaluating or our customers could evaluate a, a technology right now and say, hey, do you do these things, right? Um, so mock basically stands for, the M stands for microservice. And what that means is, you know, this technology that let's say you're uh, purchasing, do they, you know, do they have just like one big piece of code that they basically manage or do they actually break that code down into multiple services? And the reason you do that is it's just easier to manage bug fix, update and things like that, right? So does that technology that you're purchasing, do they, uh, you know, have a microservices architecture, right? Um, so that's, that's, the, the M, the A comes from API first. Now, API is, is a way of communicating between two different systems, right? And in the world today, you have to, any, any technology that you buy comes up, you know, has a set of features, but that's not enough. You want that, you want that system to talk to other systems as well. And you do that through the API. So if, if this technology doesn't have API built in, then it's probably going to be pretty painful for you. Uh, down the road, right? So A comes from API first. C is cloud native. Now, you know, we've been building software for a long, long time. And cloud came about, I think around 2006, 2007. And what it did, it, it changed the way you delivered software. And it made tons of stuff easy. If, if you know, if, if the software was built 100% from day one on the cloud, it's very different than some legacy software that was built in the early 2000s or the 19. 90s, right? Um, so is it cloud native? That's the question you can ask. And then the last bit is headless. And the headless comes from, you know, we live in a world today that's multi-channel. You know, you have web, you have mobile, kiosks, digital signage, you know, watch. And tomorrow there might be more, more things, right? So uh, so those experiences are, are uh, all of these channels that, that keep coming up. The older technologies kind of just work with the web. Right. 
And so you want to make sure that any technology that you purchase is headless, as in the experience part of it is completely decoupled from the back end. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the mark. That's like a quick way of just evaluating the technology, basically. Got it. Microservices, API first, cloud native, and headless. I think as headless. the marketer, the headless part is almost the most exciting part because <laughs> it just I think it it um it just speeds up your life, right? It speeds up your your business. Totally. Totally. Okay, so composable. Let's now talk. We talk mock. Let's now talk composable. Sure, yeah. And composability is more sort of an architecture, right? So uh, think of uh, Lego, right? You have all these sort of building blocks and the building blocks are basically technology that's mock enabled, right? So the building blocks, the technology that's mock enabled, and then you're putting it all together uh, in a composable way. And so, so it's more of an architecture. And the reason you do this is it gives you sort of the ultimate flexibility to you know, take things in and out. Technologies come and go, right? You might buy some technology that for some reason just doesn't stay up with the time and it, you know, it, it gets outdated. You just want to switch that out and put another building block in, right? So, so the best way to sort of, you know, future proof um, your tech stack is sort of adopting this composable architecture where you have all these like building blocks that you're gluing them together to ultimately provide that experience for your end customer, right? Um, so yeah, so composable is more of an architecture uh, uh, that that goes alongside with mock technologies. Got it. It, it it's um, almost surrounds all of those design principles. And when you say technology, I want to be very clear. It's it's kind of products you're buying. So if I'm an enterprise, it it would be um, it could be your CRM tool. Um, it could be your data product, um, uh, automation yeah. tools, et cetera. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's, there's so many tools that we use today, right? You have pro project management, you have, you know, the, the CRMs, like you said. Um, so all those systems, you know, you, you look at them and you basically ask the, the, the question, is it microservices, API, cloud native headless? If it's yes, then most likely you can kind of put them all together and then you know provide that experience that you need for your end customer. Okay, so let's go to the next slide and dig in on that a little bit because that that is one of my questions. Like, let's say I'm going to buy a CRM tool. Does every CRM tool work in a composable architecture in a composable environment, or like what are those, as we say here, indicators of composable architecture? Yeah, um, so this kind of goes alongside the mock. It has to be decoupled, right? Um, these these individual technologies. So let's say your CRM itself, it should be able. You should be able to deploy it by itself, not you know worrying about all the other things that go around it. And it should be able to scale itself, right? Like today you have a business of X, and then tomorrow you have a business of ten X. Uh, it should be able to scale. So so this this technology that you're buying should be completely decoupled on its own. That's number one. Cloud native, this kind of goes alongside similar to Mark, but you know, it has to be kind of totally hosted on a SaaS, or it could also be a PaaS you know, platform as a service. Um, and you know, if if you think about the, sort of the, the 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 legacy systems, if you have to install and maintain an upgrade, um, you know, that's that's sort of a red flag. So it has to be 100 percent cloud native. Um, and then the headless and the API enabled. So, you know, as we talked about from a mock case, from the building block, the same thing kind of goes with the with the composable uh, indicator as well. Uh, it has to be headless. It has to be uh, API enabled. Um, modular implementation. So it has to be able to integrate really well with all the other things that go around. So in your example with the CRM, does it integrate with your project management software? Does it integrate with your data warehouse? So, you know, it has to be very modular. Um, the agility and extensibility, it, um, you know, in, in sort of the cloud world, you get these frequent releases, right? Uh, if you're installing a software and having to wait for the maintenance and the upgrade cycles, that's not composable, right? So you want to make sure that the software uh, that you're buying has, uh, uh, you know, all those extensibility sort of uh, built into it. 
And then the ultimate, the scalability and, and stability. Like you don't, as a customer, you don't have to worry about the stability of the system. It has to have, you know, four nines or hundred percent uptime. And then in terms of scalability, it has to have that elastic uh, scalability. You, you as a customer should not be worrying about, is this service going to scale when I have, when my business grows 10X, right? Um, so yeah, so these are some of the indicators uh, for like a composable uh, technology. And, and do you think, is this a good checklist right here, what we're looking at? Is this something that I could take to uh, a vendor and almost go down this list if I want to be sure that I'm making the right decision, if I want to go composable? I think so, yeah. This is, I mean, it, it checks off, I would say, 80, 90% of your, your needs. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of other things you could ask for, but this is kind of the risks you from purchasing something that's more sort of legacy and will not work well with all these other systems, right? Um, so regardless if you're going down the composable architecture or not, you should buy software based on uh, these indicators. Okay, so everybody just uh, screen grab this and uh, or put it up, put it up next to your calendar. It's important. Um, so if we can go to the next slide now, and this is where I get uh, maybe a little bit annoyed as a marketer because I've I've worked as, at agencies, I've worked in house, I've worked on our websites, I've collaborated on websites, and in the past, I have very admittedly felt frustrated uh, with the the web products that I've used. Um, for example, wanted to build some simple custom landing pages. And it took, you know, six, seven, eight weeks of an IT ticket for me to do it when I wanted to launch a contest in time for X seasonal date. Um, just simple things that felt simple to me. And I felt it was because I wasn't tech technologically skilled enough, right? So I <laughs> thought it was my skills. But now what I'm hearing is that maybe it's partly that, but maybe it's also the technology that I was using. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I would say so. I think that technology has a big, um, big part to play here because, I mean, you could buy a technology that's just hard to use, right? Hard to, I mean, think about the legacy software. You, you buy this thing and then it takes you months and months to just install and get it up and running. And then you try to build what you want to build uh, oh, well, what was your initial reason to purchase it right so it takes just forever to in uh, first install and get it up and going and then you have to worry about upgrade cycles and maintenance windows and all sorts of stuff and then you know then that's why the ticketing system kind of comes in because it is just backlogged just taking care of this system that they purchased you know for basically serving the business user and now the business users have to wait <laughs> Um, yeah. so they can get this up and running to serve you. So anyway, so it's, it's just this like endless cycle. Um, you know, that, that is a big challenge. I think with the composable approach, um, it, it takes a little bit to get going on that. But uh, once you, you know, for your IT department is not worrying about the uptime. They're not worrying about the installation. It's already there. It's all cloud native. It's API enabled. It's just a service that you have to consume, right? Um, so they get that um, ultimate agility. Um, so, so I think a time to market from that perspective, you know, as the business shifts and, you know, businesses are shifting like crazy in, in these days, right? Think about the pandemic, literally over, overnight, everything changed. Uh, so how do you pivot from that? Well, your technology stack have to kind of help the business to be able to pivot, you know, based on the market, market needs. So, uh, the composable architecture is sort of the best way to go in terms of uh, get, giving that, uh, you know, the, the best time to market, if you will. Yeah, so so if, if we're talking about challenge solution here, right? So we talked a bit about how composable can take something from months to market and completely flip that to it could be days, depending on what it is. Um, what about yeah. rigidity to flexibility? Yeah, so uh, again, I think those are uh, legacy systems, right? It's, it just takes so much to just maintain those systems, right? Um, so it's it's inherently just not flexible. Um, the the composable architect architecture, you're not ex you're not basically buying this behemoth. You're buying like components, right? You go to vendor one vendor for X. You go to content stack to serve, to manage and deliver content, right? You go to the e-commerce vendor to do the e-commerce bit. You go to the search vendor to do the search bit. Right, so you have this like 
flexibility to swap things in and out, right? So it's not rigid. Like once you have this sort of composable architecture, as the technology also keeps changing, you can introduce new vendors. You can take the old vendors out. So you get this like ultimate flexibility uh, once you are on this composable architecture and you're future proofing, right? Your business uh, and, and just basically staying nimble as your business moves, as the market shifts, your business moves. You can also move along with that. Like the technology stack can be the enabler uh, finally, right? Um, so yeah, so that's that's great. Um, I think on the, the integration, I, the, the next point, I'll just take it from here, the siloed bit um, with the composable architecture and you know, you're making sure that they're mock enabled, right? So API first, does it integrate with everything else that's, that's around um, you know, that technology, right? Uh, so you'll right away, it's not going to be siloed. You'll be able to integrate it with the data warehouse uh, systems. You might be able to get like an integration uh, vendor in there and help you integrate all the data across all the systems, right? So and glue all these things together. Um, so the integration is much better. And I think ultimately um, it gets you out of the status quo, right? There's, we see a lot of uh, companies just saying, okay, we just want to kind of stick to what we have, right? And it's usually just because they... We're getting a lot of no's from IT, right? And we have to kind of say, hey, if you go down this path, you will be able to, you know, create experiences that you dream of for your customers. Versus right now, it's just like, oh, can we just do the, the least amount of work, right? Because it's just so hard to make, make those changes. I think you'll, you'll get that um, with the composable architecture. You'll be able to, you know, provide the experiences that you want. Yeah, it's almost, um, we have the term digital differentiation here, but I think it's also almost separating yourself from this sea of sameness. Like, because we live in a world where there's so much, um, you know, it's so templated, and but then templates, it's good, right? But it's not great for enterprises necessarily, because you're not going to win over customers that way. Yep, exactly. Um, and, and, you know, these experiences also, like, you, you see some of these brands that are constantly evolving and coming up with, you know, AR, VR, and AI, and just the experiences, right? Like, as, as a consumer, you, you consume these experiences from these brands, you're like, wow, how do they do that? Um, you know, they've, they've done that because they have a composable architecture. They can move really fast. If a new technology comes in, they can actually adopt that technology. Right and provide and integrate that with that experience that they want, versus you know if you stay with your status quo and your legacy vendors, forget like the new things. They just can't do the the absolute minimal things, right? Um, so it, it's basically it just kills your business. I think if you don't kind of go down this path. And I think you've seen also a lot of uh, customers that uh, on content stacks and that have gone composable and then even reaped benefits not just for their business but also for their careers right like they convinced they were the champions of composable within their organizations and then uh, got promoted yeah. because there was so much success right and they challenged us totally well. it, totally and you know it's it's i mean we've been kind of sex been around for for a while as a company started in 2018 but the technology was built uh, way ahead. So we had some early adopters that kind of took a chance with this. And the beauty of the composable architecture is you don't have to rip and replace. You could actually take a small project and bring in one or two vendors and provide that solution or the experience that you're going for, right? So, so there were, you know, and these customers, you know, they've been with us for years. Uh, there were, I would say, the early adopters that kind of uh, went on this journey with us and they reaped uh, a lot of benefits, actually. Awesome. Where would you say composable is in terms of uh, acceptance, mainstream acceptance uh, in the industry? You know, the composable, um, it's been around. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I think we're seeing a lot of people going down this path. Like you're already composable. I mean, if you think you, you are or not, you are. I mean, you're using, as a business user, Marielle, I'm sure you're using like Google Docs. Uh, you know, uh, Slack and, and CRM, like Salesforce, you're using, you're already using so many things, right, in your company. Um, so mostly everyone is in that uh, sort of realm. Um, so I, I'm actually seeing, and, and let me just say content like for example, like we have like over 200 
different tools that we use within our company. And uh, we're proud of that, actually, because we want to keep innovating. And the way you innovate is you also want to see what's going on. What are the new solutions that are out there? And we are adopting those, right? Um, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I think we see a lot of companies kind of going down this path. And even bigger sort of traditional um, companies, you know, they're, they're completely, um, you know, going down this path and, and reaping the results from it. So... Yeah, and actually, I pulled. Uh, let me let me quote uh, one of the trade outlets that actually said, uh, "Composable is the next fundamental shift in technology," and that that same outlet uh, said that it compared it to the rise of SaaS. So it, it's just going. You're saying we're already here, but it's only going to get increase. It's only going to increase, and more people are going to talk about it. More people are going to know what it is. More people are going to go composable. Totally. Totally. And, you know, it's, it's been sort of in any, any sort of new thing or new trend, it takes a while uh, to get sort of the mainstream adoption. But like I said, mostly everyone, if you think you're in or not, you are already in. You're using a bunch of tools. Uh, from an IT perspective, I'm sure most of these IT uh, departments out there, you know, they're using tons of different, uh, you know, point-based solutions or big, bigger systems. And they're talking about integration. Um, so this is going to continue to, uh, you know, grow. Yeah. And you also have Levi's on the next podcast. So they're, th these are big companies um, that are leading the charge here. So four companies that like that, that have been doing it, and we can go to the next slide. Can you talk a bit about what sort of um, results are they seeing? And here, you know, talking business results, ROI. Yeah, so from, from a content stack perspective, right? Content stack is a content management uh, platform delivered in this sort of uh, cloud native uh, headless way. Um, and it's used for by these brands to deliver, you know, the experiences to their customers. Uh, we've done this um, research with Forrester, uh, you know, our customers got 295% over three years in terms of ROI, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, and and it's it's not just about sort of the immediate sort of ROI returns, right? It's it's that ultimate flexibility. I think if you if you talk to some of these customers of ours, they feel uh, pretty confident about you know not just today but about the future as well because they know whatever is going to come down the road in the future, they will be able to easily adopt that, right? Uh, because they've sort of went down on this journey and they're not stuck with with the status quo. So. Uh, yeah, the, so the ROI, which we were also, you know, like ecstatic uh, when when this when this report came out, two hundred ninety five percent over three years in terms of ROI. That's, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, and, and to to your point of feeling confident, it's also empowered, right? Like you you have the tools you need to be the best you can be at your job, and to make those whatever dreams you have, whatever wishes you have, come true with the technology. Yep, totally. Um, so for those that haven't made the switch to Composable yet, what do you think typically holds them back? Like what, why, why are they not doing it? I mean, I would say maybe, you know, with anything new, right? Like you, you would say, oh man, it's going to be too complex, right? So that's kind of one reason, one thing we see. And second, I would say is, you know, um, whatever is working is working. It's like, it's good enough, right? Like staying with the status quo um, and, and not realizing the actual benefit uh, that would get going down this journey. So I think those two are probably the biggest reasons um, from, from going down this path. Got it. Um, we've talked a lot about this, but if you could just boil it down to a statement, right? Like this is your headline. <laughs> No pressure, Sean. Um, what would uh -oh. what would be the reason why going composable now is an imperative for enterprises? I think if you want to stay competitive uh, in the market and be around, actually, uh, you have to go down this path. If you don't go down this path, I think it's just a business killer. You will not be able to survive in the future. How, how, how's that, Mario? <laughs> Business killer that perked me up. 
I don't want to be around that. Well, I mean, if you think about the pandemic, right? Uh, you know, it was it was something that we no one thought was going to happen, and it did happen. Some of the some of the companies that came around were the ones that um, you know were able to quickly pivot and switch, and were able to go to their IT department and say, "Hey, can your tech stack really help us with this switch that we want to do from a business perspective?" Right. The people that were stuck with the status quo, with all those legacy tech, with the immovable parts, you were just out of luck, right? And that was a business killer. So, so that that's what I mean. Like, um, I don't want to sound too too bad here, but uh, it, it gives you this ultimate flexibility, right? Um, and so, if you go down this path, there's the initial learning curve, right, to go down this. And like I said, you don't have to rip and replace. You can start out. With a small project, you you try out try this out with a couple of you know um, experiences that you want to deliver. Go and work with a couple of vendors. Um, get your teams, uh, you know, to kind of adopt this. Come up with the new processes so you can kind of go slowly uh, down this path. It's not a rip and replace. Um, so yeah, anyone can and do you, it. You wrote recently about many transformations. And I, I liked that idea because I do think we throw around that term digital transformation so much in this industry. And, you know, it's cool and all, it sounds catchy, but at the same time, it also feels very overwhelming. Um, and, and this could feel overwhelming too, but this idea of many transformations helps you break it down a bit. Can you just expand a little bit on what you were just saying, like how you don't have to go all in all at once? You can take it in steps. Yeah, so I, you know, let's just take if the if it if it's an initiative from an IT department, um, you could say, okay, I have my traditional CMS already in place, but my marketing department's asking me to do these like ten different landing pages, and if I do it with the traditional way, it'll take me like three months because I got to rebuild the templates and all all sorts of stuff right that goes along with that. You could go and just you know get a SaaS enabled you know, uh, CMS like content stack and take care of that in, you know, a matter of days or weeks um, and, and just try it out. Uh, so that could be one way of uh, enabling it. and you don't have to touch anything else that goes, goes around that. Just deliver that initial requirement and then you'll see the business results and maybe it will help you make the case that, hey, we should go down this path, right? So that's from the IT side. From the business side, if you want to do some campaigns and there's simple services out there that will let you build, you know, campaigns, um, you know, and you can go ahead and use one of those services and get your marketing message out there, um, you know, and, and, and get comfortable with it and, you know, get your business returns and then maybe you can get others to kind of come along the journey as well. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of things you could do uh, to go down this path and adopt new technologies and bring new technologies, get people on board as well by showing results, right? Um, so yeah, so those are kind of the mini transformations that we talk about. If you're, if you think that your business it's hard to move, you know, and change people, you could just start out with these smaller sort of yeah. requirements and projects. And the beauty of the SaaS software is you can just consume it. You know, you can just consume it without any insulation and IT involvement and things like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, get some quick wins show off the results if there's any skeptics make sure they see the results right and then and then get some allies right get some internal allies to make it bigger and bigger the swell <laughs> <laughs> totally uh we could go to the next slide so clearly you have a lot of expertise in this like is this something that uh enterprises have to figure out on their own where what sort of support is there in the marketplace? Uh, where could marketers and others go? Yeah, I mean, from a content side perspective, um, you know, we started this journey a, a while back. Although the company uh, was formed in 2018, this technology was built uh, back in 2011. You know, we were one of the first ones that pioneered this concept called headless CMS. But even prior to that, we were basically a digital consulting company helping, you know, uh, companies adopt the cloud, like transition to the cloud, right? Uh, do the digital transformations back in those days in 20, 2009, 2010. So we at ContentStack actually are 
um, we're, we're more sort of services oriented, right? Um, although we built uh, many products, including content stack, which came about as a company in 2018. So what we've done is we have uh, this concept called care without compromise, right? So our support is uh, just, you know, absolute best out there. Um, we will not let you down. You know, we, we like to say that. So in this composable journey, you have, you know, not just content stack that you have to kind of deal with, but you might actually go and buy maybe an e-commerce engine or a search vendor or whatever it is. We partner with these vendors and we provide you cross vendor support, right? So we're not going to just say, hey, this is not us, go, go over there. We'll actually help you out uh, with, with any issues that you're having on your composable stack, right? Um, so that's that's one. The other one, you know, we have something called enablement services. So once you kind of uh, become a customer, we have a team that basically enables you on this uh, composable sort of journey, if you will, right? So they'll help you out with that composable stack, if you will, like the architecture of it, uh, the the planning, the process, uh, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, kind of work with you to, you know, uh, go down that journey. So that. Uh, that's something we have. And then there's uh, some technology just in our past. We were, we've also built uh, a integration product uh, in the past. And we brought that knowledge back into content stack and we built something called automation hub. And what that means is it just lets you automate, uh, you know, you with content stack, you can sort of automate uh, your composable stack. It's kind of the glue that can bring all the other vendors together. So that's this, the technology bit that we, uh, you know, uh, released last year and we're, we're keep adding, keep, uh, we're, we're, you know, adding more things to it. Um, there's also a community that you can join. Our customers can go join and ask questions and get 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 answers. Um, last, I would say is uh, you know, Content Con. Uh, it's it's our conference yearly conference that we go to. So this is where you know customers and partners kind of come together and collaborate. So yeah, we do uh, a lot to help customers go on this uh, composable journey, if you will. That's awesome. I, I know I, I read a quote. Um by Content Stack CEO recently that said, we built the, the headless CMS and then an entire industry on its shoulders, an entire support system on its shoulders. And that's, I think this is the support system right here. Totally, and we realized this, right? Like just, just to give you my, my like we, we built an integration in the cloud product before or prior to Content Stack. And, and that was just our, you know, thinking that, you know, if you have a product, right, if you, if you have a technology solution, just by itself has a lot of value, but it has like exponential value when it works really well with that ecosystem of all the other vendors, right? So what can content stack do to enable that? So we brought our expertise, integration expertise, and we added that on top of content stack. So our customers can feel more comfortable, I guess, to not just get content stack, but also work with you know all these other vendors uh, that are out there. Uh, so from a technology perspective, we we uh, you know we built that, <laughs> put it out there. That's, I feel like we could have a whole other conversation on just how to create and manifest cross vendor collaboration. Everybody can learn a lot from that too. <laughs> For sure. Um, so. One last question is for all the change makers out there, everyone inside the organization, whether it's the first time they're hearing about Composable, uh, whether they already knew about it and it's something they want to do, but for whatever reasons, there's obstacles inside the organization. What is the one thing you would tell them to do next? If you have two, that's fine. But what is the one thing you would tell, tell them to do tomorrow? Mariela, can you just, sorry, I, you cut off a little bit there. What is the one thing you would tell the change makers listening to do tomorrow to start their composable journey? I think take a step, like start with the, start with the project. I know, I mean, it, it feels like everyone wants to do it, just do it. Um, it's, you know, it seems overwhelming, but uh, it's all possible. Embrace and, and we're here to support you. We're here to support you on that journey. Thank you, Nishan. Is there anything else you wanted to say? No, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mariela. Thanks for putting this on. Super fun. I feel smarter already. Thank you. All right. Talk thanks to you later. Bye.